polarization. Reality is composed of opposites. Saw, hard. Night, day. Heavy, light. The exercises known as Tai Chi Chuan express this philosophy. That within each of the exercises or forms are opposites. Retreat, advance. Pull, push. Defend, attack. Yin Yang. Together is Tai Chi Chuan. Raising it to hands. It's the commencement of Tai Chi Chuan. It is our hope here to help you learn a series of physical movements, which is simultaneously a philosophy and exercise, a path to better physical health and a fundamental to self-defense. In Tai Chi Chuan, we begin slowly. The stillness precedes motion. Slowness precedes speed. Softness precedes strength. In stillness and in slow motion, the path can be traced segment by segment. In speed, only the start and finish are discernible. The art of living is the greatest of all arts, and studying Tai Chi is an important aspect of that. I was born in 1910. I have seven children ranging from four to 44. I have studied with many masters, particularly Master Wang Wen Shan, and I have taught in many places. Aiding me will be my student, Victoria Mallory, whose appearance and technical perfection has very few equals in America. This tape divides into five sections. The temple exercises, instructions in form and technique. Then the 27 forms, isolated and examined one at a time. The short form, the 27 forms as one. Use this section as a daily performance guide and then push hands and exercise with two people and self-defense, the martial art aspect of Tai Chi Chuan. Hidden within the forms of Tai Chi Chuan are movements which in the combat situation can either block or attack. <laughs> the combat applications are just as important as the gentle movements of the forms, the one yang and the other yin. Tai Chi Chuan it's the whole manifest in opposites. We are about to do a series of movements known as temple exercises. These temple exercises keep the monks from being too inert from long meditation. The movements tones the muscle, the vascular system, the neural system, and most important of all, the meridian system. And these exercises are done both fast and slow. The routine comprises 10 forms and usually done with 50 repetitions each. And they are done in a calm manner that is suggestive more of dancing than actually vigorous exercise. But they're very effective. Why are they effective? because they move something that is yet to be determined in the West what it is, they move the meridian, the chi force, the chi conduits of the human body. With Victoria's help, I will now show you how to perform the temple exercises. While learning, you should practice along with Victoria and be playing the tape several times over a period of days until you have mastered each exercise. Once you have learned them, it will be to your benefit to exercise regularly. How many and how often are a matter of individual choice. Attention, we are about to do a prayer wheel. We are 
extending our left foot forward, the right foot is back, your height in the movement does not change one bit. You are constant in your height, but the two arms are 12 inches apart, and the movement is actuated by the legs and not by the arms. The arms follow the impetus of the legs. And the circle is about 12 inches or 15 inch in diameter. And the tips of the fingers should not extend beyond shoulder height. The two palms are constant in the distance apart. There is a pumping movement suggestive of the fact that the entire body is pumping the four conduits of the human body, such as the vascular system, the lymphatic system, and the neural system. But most important, we are pumping or we are moving the chi system, C-H-I. The more movement, the more chi. And the more chi, there's more life. And you should always turn and do the other side subsequently with the same amount of repetitions. You can step forward and with the left foot. The right foot is now 45 degrees pointing from the center line. And it's just a soft movement, empty of everything. Fine. This is a knee rotation. Place your two palms on your kneecap. Be in the position of a person ready to dive into a swimming pool. There's a 90 degree angle from the sides to the back. The back is kept straight, although inclined. Because of the knees are rotating, Six major acupuncture points are being activated. When you activate them, you activate the whole human organism. Now you do a certain amount in a certain direction, which should be around 50 or more. There should be a corresponding amount going the other way. Going the other way, yes. But be sure at all that time, the height of the human frame is not up nor down, but remain constant. The breathing is soft and relaxed breathing. There's no necessary any what they call assertive breathing nor receptive breathing. It's just soft all the way through. The arms also placed upon the kneecap are not tense. Just place that nicely. Relax. This is the cross arm exercise. The two arms are kept on the shoulder level. But look at the point of contact that forces you to turn your spine back and forth in a rotary motion. You notice as you hit this way, this, and then again open it up, we are introducing you to the idea of a reciprocal movement. It comes in, goes out, goes in, comes out. In other words, up and down, top and bottom, left and right are always reciprocal, in which case the muscles develop a balance which otherwise would not exist if you do one single exercise to excess. When you hit, you breathe out. In, out, in. This is a flying exercise. The movement is done from the legs upwards using the strength of the thighs and the calves to push the arms up. You do not have to go all the way up to the top. I would suggest 25 with the palms up and 25 movements with the arms down. The movement is from the center here so that 
It's very easy to lift the arms up if they're empty. If you tense the arms, it's extremely hard. This is a taking fruit exercise, probably the oldest exercise known to man. You're reaching up as your ancestors did a million years ago, as they come under the tree to pick the goodies to sustain human life. So this movement is maybe have done all the ways since human history began, reaching out for it, reaching out to pick a means of survival, a means of food, a means of thirst, reaching out because there are always trees and always fruit since the beginning of time. reach as far as it can so that every joint is stretched and so that the chi that flows to the fingertip is extended, so to speak, chi-wise or electrical-wise all the way to the fingertip. Look at how natural this is. Reach way up there. So we reach out and always have been and this is what makes us human in configuration. We have fingers that are holding the fruit. We say, way up. Get that real white one up there. Yeah, that one. Way up. I hope to. This is a swinging exercise in two parts. The first part it's a Shanghai hospital exercise, world famous, in which the initial position of the arm is 30 degrees in the front, ultimately reach out to 60 degrees in the back there, and there's a continuous motion as if that you are sitting in a canoe and you lost your oars and, and you push hard against the water with the palm of your hand. So there is very little action coming up forward, but there's a lot of action pushing toward the back. Now this is the first part of the category. The second part is you do the same thing with the legs. Now she is, now many times we use a chair by holding on. In this instance, I think Victoria is so well balanced that she will swing the legs without holding on to anything. Way up, back, way up, back. You usually do about 50 to the right maybe do it two, three times to have an aggregate of 50, and then you turn to the other side with the left foot. Way up. You see how this hip is liberated? So liberating two of the main joints in the human body, the shoulder area and the hip area. Now you must take care so that you do, it, do this easy at first, so that you develop a fluidity and a looseness of the hip before you go into multiples. Fine. <laughs> You know that I delegate the, <laughs> the movements. Now this is the grinding of corn. And you're grinding the corn which is on top of the stone table which is knee high. You use a little bit of your own weight pressing down on it which can be actuated through the movements of the knees and thighs. Try to keep the two hands at the same height, otherwise you'll be grinding air. Now this is not an easy movement. You use the body like she does there by actuating the movement from side to side with the strength of the thighs, the strong buttock muscles, and the flexible knee so that the arms are somewhat loose but holding firmly to the stone so that there is a grinding movement made by two circles blending into one another by two circles like this. You watch it very closely, you know that she is constantly holding the stones knee high so that the stones are always in contact with the dry corn. Now this is the grinding of corn. It's a little bit more advanced than the other movements because you have to learn how to make these two circles coordinate one with the other.
All things need polishing, particularly mirrors and windows and art objects. So this is a universal movement because humanity has these treasures which must be taken care of, particularly your health. This is polishing the mirror. The two hands goes down to the center of the mirror and the two arms goes circular like as you go up to meet the presumably wrong mirror and you're holding two pieces of chamois in your hand and you're polishing the set mirror. You use the bodily strength to press against it as she does and keeping in mind that the mirror is perpendicular to the ground and the two hands are not going backwards but holding to the mirror itself. There is a two circular movement, half circle movement to the peripheral of the mirror and the two hands going down for the center of the mirror. Two actions, not only in the legs, but in the body pushing forward against the mirror to give it a good polish. The arms are in movement, the legs are in movement, and you can have variation by coming down this way and going up the other way as part of the movement so that the all parts of the muscle relating to that area are in motion. By pressing and concentrating on the flat of the hands, you enable the chi to flow into the natural acupunctural terminal points in the fingers. You breathe up as you go up, breathe in, I mean to say, and you breathe out as you go down. This exercise is known as a advanced and retreat, a compound movement. This is the essence of life, forward and backwards. And in the intelligence of the individual rests on how and when. The foundation of all great physical education system lies in the understanding of the development and maintenance of the center of the body and the movement therein or thereof. In this case, sexual, the eliminative, and digestive. There are two parts of this movement. First, the retreating from this side to that side and vice versa. The body retreats through the use of the legs and the hips. As you turn, you retreat by sitting down on the hind leg, by pushing with the front leg backwards. The body is kept perpendicular to the ground, the spine is anyway, the head is kept outright, and you look at the direction from whence you are retreating. Now, in the advance, you just push the hind leg forward. And you turn, so it's like you're advancing on something, coming at something. Now, it looks very similar, both sides, but actually, completely different sets of muscles are engaged in the action. Movements without fatiguing actions, which causes residual fatigue acids. Movements from the center of the body, wherein the major organs are located. Breathing softly, long and deep are the fundamentals of Tai Chi Chuan. There, and it's just a soft movement empty of everything. Fine. Relax.
Now we are in the core of the proceedings, the forms of Tai Chi Chuan, the simplified form. The short form is an abbreviated series of movements derived from a much longer exercise that comes down to us from ancient times. The first of the form will be the commencement of Tai Chi. Stand relaxed. Keep the two feet about 10 inches apart. Bend your knees slightly and then raise your hand gently and without force. The first movement not only in Tai Chi, but also in mankind. When you raise up your hand, you meet your mate. When you raise up your hand, you meet mama. When you raise up the hands, mama say, baby. When your two hands are up. Once more. You bring your arms slowly as if this is a five foot ball and reaching the top of the ball like this and you feel the smooth of it and finally come down here. And the hands way up there, here's a great big ball underneath you. Now feel the roundness of that ball there and come down and put the thumbs again your clothing. The arms are brought up very slowly, empty. The partition of the wild horse's mane. This is partition of the wild horse's mane, and it develops a tremendous waist movement, almost like a winch. Watch this waist movement. The hands are carrying the ball, like a beach ball, in a preparatory position, called defensive position. You step out with the left leg, turn. This one is going that way, and this one is going this way. You see? <coughs> The wild horse have manes are almost touching the ground, very tough. Sometimes you have to use a whole arm like that to pop the rough mane, almost like a curtain. Once more. Now you part. The power of parting is great. Turn. The partition of the wild horse's mane. This is the same move repeated, but in the opposite direction. And back again. This is a duplication of the first movement, the partition of the wild horse's mane, in that you turn to the left side, and then you return to the original right side. It's very important that the the body is seven eighths or three quarters facing the direction of advance. And it's not fully like that, or it's not sideways like that, but about seven eighths. You must keep in mind that this kneecap, kneecap comes right down to the toes. It mustn't be over and mustn't be insufficient. But it's 70% of the weight on the front leg and about 30% on the hind leg. The white stalk cools his wings, a very classical form. This is a complicated movement. And this hand going to its destined place 
this arm going to its death in place, and this left leg coming to this place must arrive there simultaneously in what they call the principle of threes. Now I want you to watch again the simultaneous movement coming to a common stop. The right hand goes up, the left hand comes down, and the left foot comes touching the ground tiptoes simultaneously. That, that, and that arrive at the same time. Now this is called the white stalk cruises wings. And it, in it are many, many symbols. Here is the shape that goes like this, the S shape, which is the center of the Tai Chi circle. And this divides the yin and the yang. You see this, the center of the Tai Chi circle. The weight is on the right leg almost totally. The left toe touches the ground to keep the balance, and this hand is above the head to protect anything that might invade this area of the entity. This hand here is curved to protect that left leg. This is the brush knee and twist step, often called brush knee for short. It's the brush knee in action. This is the left brush, right push. Initial turn of the left foot so that you can get on the other side in balance. Now the turning of the body in the opposite direction, identical with the previous movement, except from the other side. Now we're going back to the original side. Left hand brushing, right hand pushing. But the alignment is very definite. The thumb and the center of the body is in line. This is in line with the curvature of the body. So this is almost parallel to the curvature in the seam of the clothing. But it's about six inches away from the kneecap so that it protects that knee and gives balance to the body. And this shoulder is dropped, both shoulders but of necessity, be dropped most all the time. The elbows are dropped. It's never extended like that. It's always like this. So there's this direct center. And it's curved simply because in Tai Chi, everything gives. See it gives? You bring the hands up to the ear as if listening. You step forward and it's the threaten with the left leg to kick. But you don't. You just slide forward and rotate the center of the body. So the left hand is defensive, the right hand is offensive. In a flash of eyelash, the left hand could be offensive. Boom, right down, down there. And the right hand can be defensive in blocking. There's no such thing as defined offensive or defined defensive in Tai Chi Chan. Playing the Pei Pa. The Pei Pa is a Chinese musical instrument. This is playing the paper. The left hand is extended with the fingers high height. Right, high height. So the left defensive position and 12 inches apart. The weight 70% is on the right leg. The left leg is 30%. It's core the insubstantial leg. The right leg is called a substantial leg because the insubstantial leg can be swept and nothing happens to her. But if she put weight on that leg there, she's in danger. Okay, once more. You lift up the right leg a little bit, replace it, and 
sink back on the right leg and lift the two hands up, and three movements are simultaneously reaching the objective. This hand, this hand here, and the left heel on the ground simultaneously. The Pei Pa is a Chinese musical instrument where you can strum it like that, and the left hand plays the keyboard. Pei Pa in certain parts of China and Pei Pa in other parts of China. Once more. That right leg must come up for a while. Get up a little bit, replace it on the ground a little closer to you, and sink on that right leg, lift that left hand up gently, lift the right leg up, and place it again on the ground with the toes up. You're touching the heel with the ground, and that knee is flexible. The pulsing of the monkey movement. Or repulsing the monkey. The monkey doesn't have the same connotation as in Western life. The monkey stands for a certain version of fate and destiny. Now let's do the movement which is repeated four times. Left, right, left, and right. Let's do it the left side. From the left defensive position, this hand changes from this into this. Now that's repulsing. This is changing like that. This is accepting. One hand pushes to repel, the other hand turns to accept or to pull. So there's a continuous motion, a reciprocal motion as you go back. Reject. And it turns, as this hand turns, as she sinks back on the hind leg, so the weight shifts, while this hand repels, and the left right hand pulls back. You see here that this leg here takes the weight. This leg here is insubstantial, but keep the body in balance. To be a good technique, the body must not bobble up and down, so there's a strong, clear line going from here all the way back as far as the height of the head is concerned. That is good technique. And the hand pushing out there doesn't push from the side like that. It must push from the center line of that jacket all the way down. Both of you have been doing it all your life. So then we'll pull it down like this way, turn. The right hand, the left hand is going to repel, the right hand is going to pull back or to receive. Again, it changes again. The weight shifts to the left leg and she sinks down. This hand goes back, this hand comes forward simultaneously and that leg, foot, I mean, corrects itself simultaneously. So therefore, there's four movements I like, excepting two movements on the left side and two movements on the right side comprises repulsing the monkey. Now we are into a complicated movement called grasping the bird's tail, consisting of four detailed movements, known as water off, roll back, press forward, which is doing now. and two-hand push. The bird's tail comprises four detailed movements. 
We turn, carrying the ball, step. There's one off and bring it over. As it's coming over, the palm of the right hand meets the palm of the left hand, go down and back. The right hand makes a circle. The whole body weight on the right leg. It turns the whole waist like a turret until the two hands are over the right left knee and using the right leg to push, that's so. It's called a press and draw back, put the weight on the right leg, and then use that as a springboard to push forward. It is in the legs that effectuates the efficiency of the movement, pressing against the ground. It's here that the cheats, sinking down on that leg. You have to have strong legs to be able to keep in balance. And then again, it pushes away forward. Now she's doing it on the other side, so that the body is equally balanced. Turn, shifting the weight to the right leg. Back, step, right leg, ward off. Bring down, roll back. Turn over the right knee. Press, draw back, back is straight, using the left leg power, push with the left leg, and hold. Single whip, a very classic movement, very beautiful movement. movement here is quite complicated and I'd like to explain it to you very in detail. It, from the two hand push it goes sideways in a half moon. It goes 180 degrees over here and this hand cuts down and makes like someone like an eagle's beak. Where in the four fingers captures the thumb. The title of the movement comes from the fact that this hand holds a whip and it turns like a turret over here, 30 degrees or so from the center, and pushes out. The left leg about to kick, but doesn't kick, instead steps forward. And as it rotates around the waist, this hand turns. And you step forward, it opens the pelvis area, and pushes. The whole body comes into motion. All movements are done with the entire body in movement. When one muscle moves, the entire body moves. When the entire body moves, all muscles move. Once more, the single whip. Turn. The rainbow. At the end of the rainbow, make the eagle speak. Turn the turret back to the back there and press it forward and be on your right leg. Hold it a minute. Open the pelvis. Step forward on the heel. Come forward on that foot at the same time the left hand is in the pushing position. The right foot is 45 degrees from the line of the dance. From a single whip into another equally beautiful but more rhythmic movement called waving hands like clouds.
that you do to the start. Single whip. When this hand comes to the 12 o'clock position, the left hand at the 6 o'clock position. It's always on the other side of the circle. Continue. Then 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock over here. Again, 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock. You move from the waist. You rotate the shoulders. You rotate the neck. The arms are making circles also. The eyes roll. Now you're going back three steps to the left. Now you're going back three steps to the right, punctuated again by the single whip. What? How to get into the single whip? Now she makes the eagle speak. She steps back, balance on the right leg, open the middle of the body, step forward, and now using the power of the right leg, push with the left hand while maintaining the whip hand. And the shoulders are down, the elbows are down, the top of the body is loose, the legs are firm. There's 70% weight on the left leg, 35% weight on the right leg. But it could be changed in a second. The back is absolutely straight. The power is in the leg. That's the single whip. This circle here, by moving it like this, has great therapeutic values. Many, many of the older members who have been practicing Tai Chi for a long time find themselves for a little time sometimes, and they, instead of doing the whole thing, once in a while would stand there like that and do many, many of the claw hands, back and forth, back and forth, and coming to this side, stepping, sometimes stepping back. Sometimes stepping forward. Sometimes staying in one place. But keeping the circles going. This is a very, very, very rhythmic and very accelerated effect on the whole human organism. High pat on the horse. Within the high pat form is another form called separation of right leg. The two hands are patting the horse's neck theoretically, but in reality the right hand pushes the opponent's hand down. So this hand goes down and this hand draws back, making by pushing this down it leads a leeway for this to go up, and the other hand supports the left hand at the angle, at the elbow area, like that. Now let's do it again from the beginning. There's a little circle with the right hand, and the left hand comes in the circle to the sternum, and this hand pushes down, the left hand comes up and it crosses. In this instance, two circles and opens up. That's it. Not an easy one to do, so it's not necessary to kick that perfect if you're a beginner. You can just raise the leg up, but don't use the body to balance it. Kick this way, but don't kick back this way to the back is maintained straight. Good. Now she's doing on the other side so that the body is equally balanced. And you step forward, the two hands block outwards but come in again and the two knuckles in front hits against the opponent's ear. And then you turn 
two hands makes a circle and crosses the hands. And when the hands are open, the legs goes out on a heel kick, facing the other direction. At first it's a toe kick, now it's a heel kick. The snakes creep down, left side. The hands are crossed and the kick is made with the left leg and is withdrawn and it slides right out and the left hand goes around the knee to protect it. And the right hand comes up in a wide swing, balancing, and the right knee comes up and there's a right angle here and a right angle here pointing the toes down. The whole entire weight is on the left leg. It's called, called the golden cockerel, stands on one leg. It has to be perfect straight balance. Not many people can do it without some quite a bit of training, maybe a couple of years of training on this particular point. You should learn to empty all the tension of the leg, empty the tension of the body, empty the tension from the top so that this alignment here sustains the posture of the left leg. But now if you are not up to it, you, might, you could do it like the way I do it because I have an injury in my knees. So therefore, it could be done this way. Without going way down, this is far down enough for most people because we don't want anybody to get having bad knees from this. Thrust this part of the body forward. Slide this leg slightly and balance yourself and come up and come up this way. Now she's doing it on the other side. The golden cockroach standing on the right leg, but on the left side. It's a, that's the reverse of the previous golden cockroach standing on the other side. The principle being that you should exercise both sides of the body to get a harmonic development. The fair ladies working at the shuttles. That's the golden, no, that is the fair lady working at the shadows on the left side. The left hand is high above the head, and the right hand is in position about shoulder high in order to utilize the right leg's power to push forward. The back is kept straight. 70% of the weight is on the left leg and the knee is just barely over the instep of the left foot. The right leg takes 30% of the weight and the knee is slightly bent. And the body is three quarters to the left side and not quite full, three quarters. The width of the thumb must be in line to the midline of the body. 
about shoulder high. It could be raised up depending on the circumstances. But the movement is usually up. The needle at the sea bottom. This is the needle at the sea bottom in which the weight is on the hind leg there and there's a slight amount of weight is on the front leg but the hand is between these two knees 12 inches from that knee and halfway down the shin bone there. The eyes look slightly forward the head weight power is located in the right hip utilizing the power of the right side. Rising from the sea bottom in, into a push with the left hand. And now she's rising and fanning through the back, meeting unexpected opposition from back of her and dealing against the adversary. Now she sweeps down with the left hand, striking down with the right hand. That has quite an involved title called The Needle at the Sea Bottom and you rise from the sea bottom. The I Ching says, let's go down, let's come up. Rises from the sea, push, then fanning through the back, blocking whatever is over there. Retreating, but retreating with the elbows thrusting out. The left hand up here, away from the eye, but protecting the head. Two circles are moving, one going down this way, one going up, but they meet over there, out there. Then you draw back and chop. You strike. With the back hand, you parry with the left hand, and you punch with the right. That ends that series. All movements are done with the entire time. Undoubtedly, because of the multiplicity of the movements, stimulate a great deal of the meridian lines in the human body, the energy patterns. Because you're turning floats and you that surround your entity. So the alertness is there. So the coordination between the top and the bottom is there in the striking. There's coordination between the drawing backwards and the coming forward again. There's coordination between the backhand blow and the left hand parry. And then again, the punch. All this requires a tremendous amount of rotation in all aspects of the human organism and thereby sequence of movement. This is the closing form of the short, simplified form of Tai Chi Chuan.
This is the apparent closing and the actual closing. <laughs> Rises and walks away. Push. Turn. Weight on the right leg. Two hands in circles. Lift the right leg up. Place it gently. Six inches away from the other foot. Pick the, the cross. Short away from one another. Press down. And that ends the whole short form of Tai Chi Chuan. The long form is shortened to 27 forms for the sake of learning. In practice, the entire series of individual forms are joined together in the one continuous movement. You may wish to use this section as a guide for daily practice.
Yin and Yang are two Chinese words indicating extremes, polarity. That is to say, it is the equivalent of opposites like hot, cold, heavy, light, male, female. Practicing the short form in solo is an experience in softness and fluidity. However, it is another matter to do the same thing in direct contact with another person. The participants are at the same time and the same instant partners and adversaries in yielding and in assertion, in defense and in attack. Sensitivity is developed by push hands techniques of touch, adherence and yielding. You must learn how to put the hands very softly. Because once the hands are rigid, I can interpret energy very easily. I know it's coming that way. But if it's extremely soft and pushing me lightly, I must be equally lightly to yield to it. The second part of push hand is that you're going to adhere. Now supposing without the adherence, she push. I just let her push. But in order to train, you must learn to adhere to it so that you're on top of the movement all the time. You, when you feel weakness, you push against it. But all of a sudden when she recovers and, and channels your aggression, and she counters attack, then you learn how to yield. Yielding means to give way with touch control, leading the aggressor to expand his force without gaining his objective, thereby setting the position for counter-attacking. And I will show you the rudimentary. Let's say we're doing this and pushing. If she allow me to get too close to her, she get pushed over because I am in momentum against her. But she, as I turn this way to push against her with my back of my hand, hands six inches away from her, she turns so that I would push into nothing. So when she pushes me, the same thing happens. As she pushed taught me taught the center here, I turn so that I divert the force. As I turn the force, she, cause she knows that she backs away. So I now begin to become the aggressor, to give an equal chance to learn. And then the same thing happens over and over again until you practice almost automatically. But you must not let the hand come too close. See, that's not that much you can allow to. Because if I let her come real close, I can't get away now, I can't get away. And I get pushed over. You always push up, you don't push down. When she pushed down at me, it's like knocking a stake down on the ground. It solidified me. Push. See, she pushes stake down on the ground. She never pushed me over. On the other hand, if she pushed me up, she uproots me. So the aim of pushing is to push up and away. See, the arms should be loose and only antenna. It's the legs that have all the power. And when you are on that leg over and over again for hours, you can imagine the power, the moving power, the flexible power, the transferable power in that leg. Or for that matter, you practice on the other side in time, the power in those legs. So therefore, some of the exercises which he told you about in the Temple exercises, this movement here, have now come to use. See the legs moving, pushing back and forth, the power? Well, it's used here. Nothing is wasted. Like Confucius says, within the four walls, all things are united, all things are related. Then there are different
kinds of hand forms. Some of us do the push hands with the back of our hands this way. Some of us would turn the hands to push in a normal pushing position. It's more easier for some people to learn to push like they push a door. Then a progression to what they call a jabbing hand. I aim to jab the sternum or jab the throat and it flicks away. So it's a question of flicking the wrist up. The jabber becomes the jabbee. So you begin to interpret those actions. That's one hand. And sometimes it's done with movement. So they learn how to adhere to it no matter what the circumstances are. I'm going away. Then you would graduate to the next phase, which are two hands. And all of a sudden, she deviates from the pattern. And all of a sudden, hits taught my face. And now, there's only one thing I can do. I kneel this way to bring the diversion over there. When I kneel this way, she's in a position of advantage. Why? because she can bend the elbow, straight look at me, and, and jabbing right me in the face. Now once you see this closely, it's easy to miss. Like that. So what do I do in this particular case when I see it coming? Instinctively, I put my hands there. I don't want this to come up here. So I put my hands there, like any, well, not at all. And I put it right here. Now, the minute I put my hand defensively there, I find myself in an inadvertent position of advantage, which means that I didn't intend in the first place, but I got there. Why is it an inadvertent position of advantage? Because the minute I get here, I can do this to her. All the tools are in the right place. I have now my hand here, my hand here. All I have to do is use the power of my waist like that. Now, the word, not only to one particular person's wishes, so when I put my hands up there like that to do that, she defends against it by putting her hands there. Now I can't, because this hand pushing against this hand equals neutrality. I can't. By putting her hands there to defend herself against my breaking her arms, she finds herself also in the position of inadvertently a position of advantage. She slides the hand down gently like that overhead to her forearm and press against my chest and push. But at that particular moment, I'm not totally inert. So as she pushes me, I just put the hand over her hand and slice it around like that and find her elbow. And I begin the whole process on the other hand and she pushes me over there. And then I put my hand here. So the whole thing is transformed on the other side, back and forth. Attack, defense, attack, and defense. Now you have Hegel. You have dialectics. The yin and yang. In other words, the defense and the offense completely in alternation. A dialectic process of two persons dealing with each other's energy. We do it a little fast for you now so you can remember how it goes. Again, the elbow and the wrist are covered. I mean, the knuckles are covered. Sometimes you change to the other side like this. Upwards. Now sometimes we move. As we push, push away and you yield to it. And sometimes you make exercise out of it. 
to the two hands again. There are different ways of holding the hands, different ways of making the circles. And each school tends to criticize the other school. What nonsense. You can, at different times, learn different things. But basically, it is what they call plus and minus assertiveness and receptivity, yin and yang. Let us say, when you push two hands like this, I push her away. And I push her. She does the same thing. I push her hand away to push her. She does the same thing to me. Now here's another form. Very simple. There's maybe dozens of forms of reciprocity. That's the word. When two persons are not in combat and are working with one another to develop the sensitivity of the body, to develop the coordination of your own body with another person's energies, this is all to the good. You can learn the fundamentals in about a week. It will take you 20 years to become extremely expert. Some people, by legend, practice in the dark. Some people can feel the other person so lightly. According to legends, that a fly cannot take off from the great master Yang's hand because when he felt that the fly was about to fly off, he just dropped his hands a little bit and the fly has no basis to project himself upwards. That's the height of sensitivity. What is martial arts? What is self-defense in a combat sense? Reduce it down to mathematics. Self-defense is the ability of the body to be in a position of advantage. If your enemy, of course, is asleep, you are certainly in a position of advantage. If he has fallen down and has broken several bones while you're hovering over him, coming into the place, you are in a position of advantage. Now, how do you get there? Well, in genetics, you're built stronger and bigger and fiercer. That's the position of advantage. On the other hand, how do one can train to be in a position of advantage? And what are the elements involved? You must be very flexible. You must be very quick. You must be able to retreat and become so nimble and loose in your frame that you can change from one position to another easily, like a cat. When a cat is asleep or crunched up there, just touch him and push him. He will reform his body in accordance to the push and keep on sleeping. Humans, when you push the untrained, when you push one part of the body, you lie to push him over the whole thing. But if he's trained, you only push only part of him or her. Now, supposing she pushed me on this shoulder. Notice that? I, and when she pushed her, my head inadvertently hit her this way. Just like when you go through a revolving door, the harder you push a revolving door, the harder it hits you in the butt. If I push her, same thing. She yields easily. I keep pushing there. In the process, she might even bite me in the arm. There's nothing. In martial arts, there's nothing that is forbidden, you know. Or, supposing here, and she cannot quite reach me with her hand, she pushes that to get me, and I learn how to yield. Now, this is a present to me, because instead of me reaching for her to grab her arms this way, she presents an arm to me. And all I do is holding two fingers like that. That's the end of the fight. That's a position of advantage. Tai Chi Chuan. It's both advance and retreat, but basically defensive. So to know how to retreat is a very important consideration. Within the forms are defensive and offensive moves, which can be applied in the combat situation. We will now examine some of the combat applications of Tai Chi Chuan.
I'm going to choke you. It push. That's one example. Elbow, forearm. One attack from the right. One attack from the left. Push me over. Meanwhile, the other man is recovering. One more time. And she goes back. Correct. This movement depends on the right leg in line with the right hand, so that the power of this hand is determined by the coordination of the right leg. So it goes back. There's a continuation of the chain of power to the first floor from this right side. And so therefore, this whole linkage is affected. This hand here is a yin hand normally used to divert or to protect that knee. That's why it's called brush knee. Actually, you're brushing the area around the knee. So whether it's a kick, or a punch of the body, or another punch of the body. That's some of the more simplified explanations. And she goes back. And this hand here, punches, this hand is received here, and this hand pushed against the elbow. Push both ways. Basically, it's a retreating movement, dealing a lot of damage while, you, while you're going back. As you go back, that left leg can come out and kick if necessary. Right. And this hand here can jab, this hand here can heal, this hand here can turn in the fist and strike, and this hand here would do bang. Many, many ways of doing it, but you can see as long as you are in balance, and as long as you move from the center, the center is three inches below the navel called the Dan Tin, D-A-N, T-I-E-N. That's the center, that's a hubcap, and these are only spokes. Now this movement here for the press is unique because it's an offensive movement. Whew, that's good to me. Yeah, that's right. The combined power of both hands against one sector here using a small surface. This thumb is captured by four fingers and after judicious training like this until it becomes toughened and is used against many parts of the body which are vulnerable and could be a dangerous weapon. It also has the advantage, for instance, you turn this way and let's say the left hand leads on my, for my face. This, this can hold onto it tight and holds it and this You can get caught within the circles of the cow hands, like sometimes people get their hands caught in gears. The two hands are quite menacing because it has a wide range of circles. It attacks high, it attacks low. It attacks low, it attacks high. It attacks high, it attacks low. For example, if you are rushing me with both hands, I, I use <coughs> cow hands on you. See? I block, push down. I block, I push down. I use the back of my hand to block, 
and put my hands to push down. I'm in control of your hands. Now what is the meaning of this crossing the hands? You cross the hands in it pushes the other pushes the hands away to open him up and then kick. See this? Opens up. Either hand would do it. Now this time I would do it with the left hand. One more time. One attack from the right. Up, and then you expose it. Either here or here or whatever necessary. Or just the hand can press down with it. That's no. And now she's rising and fanning through the back meeting unexpected opposition from back of her and dealing with it. The elbow. Chop. Draw back. Chop again. Draw back. Backhand blow. Curved leg. Parry and punch. It blocks it. And when it blocks it, it has this effect. the other way around. Many ways of doing it. But this allows you to block against a kick and when the hand comes, block it. And this hand holds up like this. This hand is free. You take this around. It is our hope that this tape will encourage you to seek out knowledge and guided instruction from a qualified instructor or master of Tai Chi Chuan. Or, if you have already done so, we hope to provide you with a useful supplement to your classes. We have really only touched upon the bare basics. Tai Chi Chuan can be a lifetime pursuit. It contains within it all of these. Moving meditation, centering, correct bodily handling, economy of exertion and motion, and parallel health development, the understanding of dialectics, and also, most important, a great step in the art of learning the art of living.